Um, you know, I was born in South Africa, um, and I pretty much uh, lived there till I was 26, which is when I came to the States. And uh, essentially, I studied architecture uh, in Johannesburg at the University of Witwatersrand, and I built my first buildings um, in Johannesburg before I actually came to the master's program at Berkeley. Hmm. So I really feel very sort of connected to, you know, that. And I, I believe my whole kind of approach was already pretty uh, established by the time I came here. I'd built, um, you know, basically I'd built, um, well, four houses um, starting when I was a student. And um, so, you know, I'd already sort of understood what practice was like and um, r realized how, you know, magical it is to actually um, make buildings. <laughs> so, you know, that was, that was how everything started for me. That seems like a fairly uncommon thing to have done four houses and to have, you know, participated in the construction of them, I suppose, um, at that age. But before entering uh, undergrad school, did you know that architecture was the calling from from an early time, or was it something else that you, you thought you might be doing? No, you know, I decided to become an architect really, really early on. <laughs> what happened was um, I was growing up in a suburb which was sort of still under construction. And, you know, while I was a kid, houses were being built on empty lots um, around where we were living. And that started my sort of fascination with building, you know, the, the smell of um, cement and you know, <laughs> seeing walls being put together brick by brick and suddenly sort of, you know, enclosing space. And so I, I used to, as a child, watch um, construction. And I, I, I was always very um, involved somehow with, um, ideas about architecture. My mother always um, reminds me that, um, you know, when I went to birthday parties um, as, as a kid, um, when I came home, I would always talk more about their houses than <laughs> the cake. And um, so, you know, my interest was pretty um, strong from, from very early on. And, and um, I, I actually bought my first architecture book, which was Raina Banham's um, um, Guide to Modern Architecture when I was 11. Oh, um, wow. it, was, it was a bookstore uh, in the downtown of Johannesburg that I somehow found, found my way to, and I, I bought that book. And um, that was my kind of first introduction to um, modern architecture. But there were also many like amazing buildings in Johannesburg. There'd been a very strong kind of international style um, connection. And um, later I, I realized that, um, you know, one of the houses that had fascinated me, which was this very pristine, modern kind of cubic house, which was very unusual in the suburb that I grew up where most of the houses with sort of pitched roofs with tiles um, had had actually been designed by Rex Martinson. And if you look in the first volume of the Irv Complete of Le Corbusier, there's a letter on the first page to Rex Martinson from Le Corbusier saying how um, thrilled he was to find such a vibrant kind of manifestation of international style in such a distant um, land, you know, in, mm -hmm. in South Africa. So there, there was a very strong architecture culture, actually, which which I didn't um, kind of discover from my parents or in growing up, but more, uh, you know, when I started studying at, at uh, architecture school. Were you surrounded by other arts, though? Did you do other things, you know, uh, as, a, as a younger uh, adolescent? Did you paint, draw, or was there other crafts involved? Yeah, I was very interested in art, and the school that I went to didn't really cater to, um, you know, that that sort of 
end of the spectrum. It was more about, you know, sports and, and things like, and, and physical education. But my parents were um, actually really sensitive to, you know, my needs. And I, I was um, taken to an art school on on the weekends, um, you know, driven right across uh, the the city of Johannesburg, and 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 dropped off at this art school, and and made beautiful things, and brought them home. You know, so my my family indulged me. My, my, my um, you know, my father was a, a a businessman. My mother was a housewife, and my two brothers actually both ended up uh, in medical professions. So there wasn't. <laughs> a kind of artistic, um, you know, link in mm -hmm. the family itself. But, but my parents did um, kind of support my interest and, and, and made sure that I was uh, catered to. So then you go and you get your Bachelor's of Architecture, right? Right. When did you decide to come to Berkeley and how did you make that decision? Uh, like, why not stay in uh, South Africa? You know, I ask myself that. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like a lovely place from what we understand. <laughs> the thing was that at my school, there had been a tradition of um, going to graduate school in the United States. And um, most of my teachers had actually gone to Penn and studied with Khan. But <laughs> by the time um, I was, you know, ready to go to graduate school, Khan had died and there seemed no kind of pressing reason to actually go to the East Coast. And I had become kind of pretty interested in, in California. The other thing is that in my sort of growing up, you know, I was um, attracted to the whole kind of free speech movement and, you know, the kind of um, transformations that were going on in California in, in terms of culture and, and you know, the counterculture. Mm -hmm. And so um, when, it, when it came to going to graduate school, I, I applied to um, UCLA and Berkeley. I was pretty sure I wanted to go to California. Hmm. And um, I got in at both schools and, and UCLA made a much more attractive kind of offer of uh, a scholarship Although I had a scholarship from South Africa that the government had had um, given me, but anyway, um, people, I I really didn't know anything about America to tell you the truth. <laughs> but people that I asked said, "No, don't go to LA. It's um, you know, it's just like freeways." And <laughs> and, and and so I ended up in in um, Berkeley. And I, I was I was quite disappointed at first. <laughs> what, what, wait, 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 what year was this for some context? <laughs> um, 1975. And why were you disappointed by Berkeley? I just remember the first time um, I drove down University Avenue. I just thought it was so ugly and, and <laughs> banal. And um, you know, I, I came. I I I had a I had met someone in San Francisco. Um, he was a he was a guy that had travelled through Africa and ended up in Johannesburg. And his name was Don Klein. And I was staying with him. I, I, I landed in San Francisco, and I was staying at his house. And he lent me his VW bag, and I drove <laughs> to Berkeley. And I got off the freeway, and I drove up University Avenue, and I just my heart dropped because I just thought it was so horrible. Um, and I still do actually. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> Um, you know, anyway, when I got to the campus, uh, you know, that was, uh, you know, it's a beautiful landscape with sort of banal buildings. But, you know, it, was, it had some attraction to me. And, and I, I only stayed in Berkeley um, for the, the year that I was in the master's program or maybe 18 months. Uh, as soon as I graduated, I actually moved uh, to San Francisco, which, you know, is is very different from how I grew up because I grew up pretty much in the suburbs and, hmm. I, and, and, you know, I felt like Berkeley wasn't um, that different, but I loved the idea of cities. And, and so, you know, I, I, I was very attracted to San Francisco and, you know, it's, 
become my home. It's a place that I love. And, you know, I want to, um, my, 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 my biggest um, hope is to just, you know, make buildings here that improve the, and continue the spirit of the city. I'm I'm sure that you've accomplished that at this point. Um, I I did want to ask about the education that you received in in, uh, in your bachelor's and then master's. Was there ever a thought that you would not get a master's, and that maybe you you were fulfilled enough by just the the I guess it's a five year program or however however many years the bachelor's was. Um, you know, I must say I had a really rigorous and 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 solid kind of education. You know, my school was um, at that time still linked to the RIBA kind of standards. Mm-hmm. And, um, it, it was a really, really, um, you know, like strong education. We we used to get like in the first few years of, of my architecture school, we we would get a project every Monday. And have to hand it in on Friday. Then it would be marked over the weekend, and on Monday you'd get another one. So by the time I, you know, come out of third year, I'd probably design, I, 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 I don't know, like maybe sixty or seventy different buildings, you know, and and they, and they were just random. I mean, it was like a, a fish canning factory one week, and then a gas station, and then a church, and then. In our house and so it, it was it was actually a really interesting way to learn architecture mm. and you know we 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 had to learn how to detail things like draw stairs and and design kitchens and so you know it was it was not a a really um strong like theoretical education even though there was this very strong underpinning of theory but it wasn't we didn't have a lot of lectures and stuff like that so the difference between my early education and then coming to berkeley they were completely opposite Hmm. like berkeley all we did was talk you know and and um we so so it was it was really interesting but i i really don't think I was educated at Berkeley. My 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 sort of um, uh, position was already established w- when I came, and it, it's quite interesting because um, I, I did this thesis uh, on uh, it was on um, indeterminism um, when I, when I finished my degree at at Wits in South Africa and. And it became quite sort of legendary, the thesis. And um, I just got an essay that um, the head of the school is writing for a book uh, about my thesis, which was, um, you know, sort of, uh, it was always held up as the kind of ideal thesis at, at, at my school for years and years. So it was, it was quite nice. I, I just read it yesterday, actually. She sent me a draft. Of, of this essay that's going to be in a Routledge um, publications. But, but you know, I, I, so I, I'd already, in a way, like established my position in architecture. And that idea of indeterminism and, you know, the sort of prospect of architecture as a tool of liberation, of creating like opportunities for the users to expand their understanding of reality. I mean, all things like that were already kind of, um, you know, I, was, I, I, I read an enormous amount and I was, I was, um, I, I, I sort of educated myself pretty much, I think, um, to, to do that thesis. It wasn't really, uh, but, it, but it was, you know, a very exciting time in the world when everything was being challenged mm-hmm. and, you know, there were these amazing writers that, like, um, you know, people like Herbert Marcuse and Norman O'Brown and uh, Ivan Illich, and everything was being challenged. And, and I was sort of, like, trying to understand the implications of those kind of questions on on how architecture could sort of become, you know, you know transformed in a way. That's really interesting to hear because... You know that jump from a bachelor's to a master's is an in, is different for everybody, right? And to have to hear you say that you felt like you were fairly, uh, maybe not totally defined, but you understood uh, what your principles were, right? Almost before you came to Berkeley, do you put that up to the fact that 
you had kind of like a lot of practice uh, in the in the undergraduate program to just do a whole bunch of projects, and that was your way of figuring out some of these uh, more core principles. Yeah, I mean, I think I I think I had a really good education. You know, the the there were really great students um, with me at Wits. I mean, one person you might know is Michael Benedict, mm -hmm. but you know, there were there were the the students were were really um, you know t smart, and we were very isolated in South Africa. You know, it's right at the tip of Africa, so we 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 really really fought to educate ourselves. I mean, I was buying books from um, you know like mail order, almost like. You do now at Amazon with just a click of a button. There was a, a famous bookstore in New York called Wittenborn that had a really wonderful catalog, and I would just, you know, be constantly ordering books and and really just because you know we 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 had very limited kind of exposure to to things like I mean there were bookstores in Johannesburg. There were a few I mentioned already. Vanguard books, but you know, we, we we just needed to like um, educate ourselves, and we and we were very um, sort of uh, you know ambitious about about um, sort of making bridges and 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 making connections. And also, uh, as part of my early kind of upbringing, the way my program worked, there were um, three years of school and then there was a practical year the fourth year mm -hmm. where um you were allowed to work in an office for half of the year and then travel for the other half so in my fourth year i actually um spent about seven or eight months um traveling in europe i went with a friend and we bought a vw van <laughs> and we and started out in London and we drove all the way to Stockholm and we went up and down um, all the way um, through Europe looking at all the kind of uh, history of architecture that we'd learned at school and, um, you know, just lived in this van for like eight months. <laughs> and that was an amazing kind of experience for me because the minute I got back to South Africa, I started looking at South Africa the same way that I'd looked at Europe. And suddenly I saw what a rich world I was living in. Mm. And, um, you know, there were, there were these um, sort of traditional architectures that were in the countryside. And as a child, I had always sort of just looked out the window when we were driving on the, you know, to go on vacation and saw these mud huts. But suddenly they uh, started being of similar interest uh, to, you know, visiting the Louvre or something. Right. So, you know, I, I, like traveling in, in, in that fourth year really sort of made me see um, Africa. And when I came back, I really began to think of my school as the kind of countryside. And around Johannesburg, where I was living, there were these um, um, in the Bailey people, and they would build these mud hats, and each year they would paint them with beautiful sort of ornamental um, like paint that was based on um, their their kind of beadwork. They 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 would, they would make beautiful like skirts and 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 hats and things out of beads, and the the kind of painting that they did on their houses was with a similar kind of discipline of you know, like uh, little geometric um, kind of uh, uh, agglomerations that would create these uh, very dense patterns. And mm. each year they would paint the houses and then the rains would wash down the paint and they would remud them and repaint them. And so I started getting very involved with um, photographing the in the belly and also traveling all over in Southern Africa and and, and sort of photographing the vernacular architectures. So, um, you know, that became the kind of basis of, of the houses that I did in South Africa before I left. They were sort of an attempt to find an African architecture that was, you know, about 
our own um, culture and time, like, you know, the, not, not the sort of traditional vernacular, but a contemporary version of, of African architecture. And that's, that's what I became pretty involved with um, in, the, in my last years in South Africa. But what happened is when I, when I came to the United States, it was at the height of apartheid. Mm -hmm. And in 1976, there was the kind of final blow, which was the Soweto riots. And um, by that time, you know, it was really unattractive to... To th and, and having been in America, you know, it just became um, unattractive to think about going back to South Africa, which right. is why I ended up staying. And also, you know, Berkeley was very hospitable. Like they offered me a teaching job and eventually I got on the faculty and became a professor. So, you know, I just slipped into this American way of living. Um, but I, I've often wondered what, what it would have been like if I'd stayed in South Africa. You know, it would have been a quite different life. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure. Um, quick question. Is your thesis available online somewhere? Um, no, but I, I have a digital copy I could send it to. I might be, I'd be interested <laughs> to, to see it. Um, so when you arrived in Berkeley, uh, obviously there were uh, aesthetic issues that you <laughs> were quite obvious to you. Um, but was there more of a, a culture shock? Because I would imagine, especially during that time, a very different scene. I mean, I've been the, I was uh, the first time I visited Berkeley really as an adult was, I, I don't know, 2005 or something. So very different from from the 70s. But when I got there, I was kind of blown away by how intense it was. You know, I think the aftermath of the free speech movement was still quite present in Berkeley. And, you know, there was an intensity. And, um, uh, you know, it was, it was really surprisingly difficult for me to, um, to, to sort of accommodate. You know, at first everything seemed like, oh, we speak the same language, you know, but it was a completely foreign um, culture and, and experience for me. And, um, you know, I just was fortunate to meet people who were really kind and, 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 and um, you know, welcoming and made me feel at home. But it, it was a shock. To, to to sort of uh, be here. Did you visit the United States before you moved to no, Berkeley? That I, was the first time. Yeah, that was the first time. I'd, I'd only been in Europe. Okay, okay. So, very, yeah, very different. <laughs> so, uh, master's at Berkeley, right? And pretty, right at, pretty much right afterwards, you moved to San Francisco. Right. And... Um, at what point did you start your office, and did you always know that you were going to have your own business? You know, I'd already, as I said, been working um, in Johannesburg. I mean, I was actually working out of the bedroom of my parents' house, which is where my first office was. And then uh, when I moved into the city, um, I um, carried on working at home. I was living in North Beach in a, a very nice Victorian apartment with like curvy bay windows that <laughs> looked out the street at the water. It was real San Francisco yeah. <laughs> sort of place. And that's where I began my work. And I was quite lucky because um, I met some South African people who had been friends of one of my teachers who had moved to Palo Alto. And um, Soon after I arrived, they gave me a job to remodel their house. And um, the payment that I got was a Ford Mustang. I, <laughs> I, I didn't um, want money. Well, I did want money, but, that, but I, anyway, we decided to do this as a kind of barter. And they bought me a, a Ford Mustang um, as my payment for, for remodeling their house. And... And that just went, you know, from one thing to another. And eventually, you know, I was hiring people to help me. I couldn't do all the work myself. And, you know, the, this, the second important job I got 
was um, Worcester Hall had um, the space allocated for a lecture theatre, which was never really finished out for some strange reason, but it was just like a raw shell. And um, the dean, Richard Bender, um, gave me the job to f to do the interior of room 112 at Worcester Hall. I, I was just lucky and I fell into things and eventually I managed to start, um, you know, working. I, I think it's really a lot harder now. I, w I would hate to have to begin a practice now, honestly. It was, it was hard enough, but it, would, it was, um, you know, in South Africa, it was really easy because um, we knew everybody and, you know, it was just real easy. But, um, but when I started here, it was really difficult. But now I think it's almost, um, you know, almost virtually impossible. I don't know how you would start your own office. Because of what factors? Um, I mean, the, you know, the, the difficulty of, of practice, you know, when, when the first houses that I built in America, I would have like 20 sheets of drawing, right. you know, and if you look at them, they beautifully built, you know, cause it was a, a culture of, um, kind of collaboration between construction and, and design and, and it's gradually um, got further and further polarized. And I mean, today, um, you know, like the same house would take 200 sheets of drawing. And, yeah. and um, you know, like a specification that would be, um, you know, as thick as the Bible. And, and everything would have to be kind of um, run through a, a legal kind of, a watertight sort of uh, measure. You know, it's just the, 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 I mean, I think America's perfected bureaucracy, you know, in <laughs> such a, a astonishing yeah. degree. And it's just become really hard to practice. I mean, just e at every level. I mean, the, the process of entitlement, you know, which has become um, through sort of, you know, I think really initially good intentions of um, democratizing, um, you know, how, how neighborhoods grow and so on. Um, you know, it's just become a, a kind of a impossible set of traps where, you know, people act out of self-interest rather than interest in the building of the city. And so they're, they're key goal is always to stop everyone from doing everything, right. you know, just to preserve their own kind of status quo. You know, it's just on and on. Honestly, it's, it's really hard. It's really, really hard. Right. So um, I just, I'm just lucky that I've, you know, I've built a really great team of people to work with me. I mean, my office is small, but, you know, I have people who've been with me for like 30 years, 35 years. Um, so we, we're really like good operation and we know how to do stuff. And, um, you know, we've, we've always been about the same size, but we've, the, the, the kind of scale of work that we can now do is just ex exponentially, um, you know, like, uh, uh, multiplied. And how many people are in your office? There's about, you know, it ranges like between, I would say, 12 and we the most we've ever been would be about 14 or 15. Okay. But the core is essentially, you know, four or five people. And then there's also a group of um, other people that have been with us for a long time. I mean, one of the things that's been really interesting is, you know, in this current environment where we're all working remotely. I mean, I'm really thankful that my team's been through a lot of like projects together, you know, and we know how to work with each other. And we've, we've really managed to keep productive and busy and to get our stuff done because we've been working together and know how to work with each other. Yeah, I would imagine that's invaluable, especially during these times. And um, I can also understand your commentary about the profession becoming much more challenging. I, I think things have become more specialized. 
in a lot of ways and that that kind of how did you put it the separation um i think exists on in many different aspects <laughs> of the practice yeah i mean you know like the planning department look at your buildings only as outsides yeah they just said oh drop this four foot you know make it lower but i mean they don't realize that then you won't be able to walk in that room <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, you know yeah. it's just like we have all these different view, uh, like viewpoints that are not comprehensive hmm. that are that but but th that are um exercising control and and um you know the building department look at everything in terms of life safety rather than like operational convenience and you know it's just it's just hard but you know nevertheless i mean we 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 are getting buildings built and <laughs> you know um and and i mean i think we you know we're trying to uh like you know keep the quality as high as possible i mean the other thing that's been really challenging is just the escalation in costs mm -hmm. so you know right now i would say we're building the most expensive buildings we've ever built and they also the worst buildings we've ever built in terms of like real quality you know we're using material that i would never dream of using like cement board for the outside you know like <laughs> it's like building with cardboard you know and and um, like vinyl windows and things like that you know that so so you know the costs have exploded so much and 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 actually like demeaned quality mm -hmm. i mean when i grew up we used to just build with brick and concrete and you know, uh, I mean, here yeah, we're building with, you know, all this sort of really insubstantial kind of, but very expensive material. Hmm. Um, so I also want to talk about that. I want to get into your work like in depth in that conversation. But uh, at the, it seemed like in the beginning of the career, your focus was more on single family houses, right? And that's expanded over time and broadened. Was there a particular reason why you decided to focus on that typology? You know, I think it's pretty common that people start their practices with, um, you know, the kinds of small commissions that, that like, like single family houses. Um, but, but honestly, my interest, and we still do single family houses and, you know, I find them really interesting and challenging, but, my my real passion is um you know cities and and the kind of continuity of the architecture of cities and building in cities so you know the the typical kind of um houses in the country and you know i must say like i developed my whole approach to architecture uh, as, as you know through building in 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 natural landscapes but um, when I started working in San Francisco, I, I, I began to think about the geography of the city as as absolute in a way as as the the kind of natural environment, and and so you know treating the city like nature and having a, a, a kind of real like ethic and character, you know. So I in a way I, I don't see the approach has having changed but i do think the actual context has different kind of um results but but really now my my main passion is you know is is cities and i'm i'm sort of lucky to be building both here and in los angeles at the moment and you know i, I I'm, I'm i'm very much about the idea that that architecture can kind of repair little pieces of cities and mm -hmm. transform them. Um, the statement that uh, to understand a city as, as being nature, could you expand on that? Um, I mean, you know, geography is a kind of evolutionary condition that has taken eons to kind of produce the current material kind of quality. And I see the the continuity of that through ideas and um you know like human decisions that make buildings um 
you know, as, as sort of a continuum with, with geography. Mm-hmm. You know, the way nature and forces um, have created certain kinds of conditions. It's, uh, you know, like buildings are just one more step in that process. Right. The other thing that you mentioned, uh, which I think translates to your current work, or your, your work that you've done in San Francisco, is that you said that some of the buildings you did in, in South Africa were sort of a, um, sort of like a translation almost uh, of um, an existing uh, aesthetic or, or type of building or, or type of architecture, but um, kind of expressing it in a different way, perhaps a modern way. And yeah. Uh, that seems also very parallel to what a lot of people would see in San Francisco. I mean, San Francisco, San Francisco is known for uh, bay windows. I mean, you know, there's bay windows, Victorian houses, these kinds of things. Is it difficult to, to I, I don't know how you would describe it, but maybe translate those, those ideas into a, a modern uh, view? You know, that's been very much the focus of my work in the city. And, um, you know, I mean, I think starting with the very first project that I did, which is 1022 Natoma Street, which is my office, uh, you know, where I really looked at the kind of um, intricacy and texture of Victorian architecture in a more contemporary way. And then, you know, something like Yerba Buena Lofts, where it Mm -hmm. is a kind of streetscape scale of this crenellated, articulated sort of um, skin of, uh, you know, of typical San Francisco. You know, so so I, I've, I've been very consciously trying to build, like, modern San Francisco. And, you know, I feel like um, there have been some strange kind of um, turns and twists and turns that have resulted in architecture in San Francisco not following the, the kind of path that um, the precedent established. You know, for me, the, the sort of quality of San Francisco is about its continuity and about the kind of similarity of, uh, even though it's built out of small pieces, mm-hmm. you know, the pieces add to a greater whole. And the, the moments that I love about the city are, you know, like in North Beach, say, where you get these bay windows that just, um, you know, like all add up to a whole right. rather than about the, the pieces. And w- what, what seems to have taken off now in San Francisco is more the idea about pieces. And I think a lot of it started with, um, the hippie movement. Now, what what happened in in the sixties was um, suddenly these sort of pastel or white um, Victorian houses, which all added up to a singular kind of aesthetic, got broken down by the painted lady kind of idea of you know each one being more important and unique than the one next to it. Mm. And th- those um, sort of painted ladies changed the city from a, a city of continuity to a city of individuality. Mm. And, you know, the me generation and the expression of, like, individuality rather than the collective, I mean, that was all part of what happened at that time. And even, you know, this sort of idea of signature architecture, where instead of architecture being part of the continuum of the evolution of a city, but, you know, like a signature piece that is about the architect, not about the, the city. So, you know, that, that's kind of like part of the ethic that's driving this sort of like collage architecture that is so prevalent now in in San Francisco when one building pretends to be like 15 buildings mm-hmm. and every material that's known to man is sort of <laughs> slapped on, you know to articulate this thing not as a piece of city but as a collection of 25 foot wide 
little houses. Hmm. So, you know, my work, I think, has to be seen in contrast to that kind of approach. And, and, and it's not about, you know, it's not about, um, like, the, the kind of artifice of collage. It's about, like, the art of architecture and about, how a building is a thing, you know, yeah. not just a kind of like mirror or, or, or wallpaper uh, uh, of, of some idea, you know, of, of, of an aesthetic. I think also sometimes I feel with the uh, collage approach, um, right? I've, sometimes I feel like it's kind of a cop out. <laughs> you know, it's over like a non answer. It, it's like they're having. It's like they're avoiding like the more difficult questions that are posed when you realize the truth, which is that the architecture, as you said, it is a thing, but it's also a component as part of a, a larger composition. So, you know, the, the things that I'm working on now that I'm quite excited about are, are you know, buildings like I'm doing a small building um, at, at, at 603 Tennessee where I really try to reinvigorate the bay, which I've always been interested in, but in this case, it's quite kind of um, intricate the way this kind of folding, um, you know, like edge between the interior and the city works and how you look up and down the street and things like that. So, you know, I'm, 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 I'm but, but it's, but it's a whole, you know, it's like one piece that um, stretches for the whole building, even though it, it's quite, you know, it's, but it's it's like a lot of the earlier building in San Francisco. You know, I think there's really beautiful models to work out of that that we've kind of ignored. Like the, you know, the the sort of tradition of those deco sort of era high rises that you see on tops of hills, like on Russian Hill and Knob Hill, and you know, those are those are really beautiful like starting points, I would say, for, for San Francisco tall buildings. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when you look at the tall buildings that are getting built in the city now, I mean, they're so, like, nondescript. You know, they could be anywhere, in any city, anywhere. And, and um, you know, so my, my sort of interest is in, like, the – incredible and unique beauty of San Francisco, which everybody agrees on, and how to kind of find ways to continue it rather than to just erode it. You know, when I come back, like, on the Bay Bridge now, and I look, um, you know, on the left-hand side, there's the old downtown of San Francisco, which are these quite, you know, sort of um, modernist, buildings, but they, they constructed, you know, they buildings that have, um, like a frame and a, and an infill and so on, and they have a material quality. And then you, you look on the left where all the new, like glass wrapping paper kind of high rises are, which, you know, the, all this blue curtain wall and stuff. And I mean, it's, it's so like, um, you know, to me, like the right hand side, so much more, um, uh, l like the city should be than the left-hand side. Right. Um, <clears throat> I want to stick on that for a moment because, you know, it's, I think what you're saying, it sounds great and it makes sense, but it's got to be not easy to do. And I say that because there are plenty of buildings which are done in a modern style, right? Uh, they don't make use of excessive, uh, you know, kind of applied decoration, and they try their best to, uh, let's say, be contextual to what's around them, especially in the case of San Francisco. And what's around them are buildings that have a lot of decoration. Uh, but these modern buildings, they fail, uh, from my perspective. A lot of them just don't look good, right? Sure. So, I mean, could you take us through a little bit and explain, like, how does that work? Because it could definitely, as I said, easily, the, I think the intention could be there, but the execution could be quite bad and it could also be quite good and you know point to some of your work like what is the difference um you know i, I mean i'm i'm just i'm just working on a uh okay do you know that building that i did 1080 Sutter street 
Uh, I'm it's terrible with names. Let me look it up real quick so we have a visual. A brick building with you know a very simple, rigorous grid, and it's clearly a modern building, but just texturally, by the use of brick and the way the bricks detailed and so on, um, you know it complements the sort of wedding cakey like stucco buildings that are on either side of it hmm. and i think you know adds up to a, a kind of coherent like character for that little stretch of the street <clears throat> so i i mean I, I i do think it's you know it's it's not hard to do <laughs> it's just the intention hmm. to do it and you know when i when i see sort of that um you know like i i, I don't know like you know mission bay type of like gestural um you know collage work i i just think it's starting from a, a point that you know isn't about real contextualism even though i think you know maybe the you know the the authors might argue that that is what they're doing but it doesn't to me add up to like a idea about san francisco you know i i think um if you if you look at like work going on say in portugal mm -hmm. um you know there's a there's a shared perspective uh, that architects seem to have um about how to continue the building of their their world and culture you know in in the present and i i just don't see us having that do you think this is a particular this issue is particularly highlighted in multifamily developments in the bay you know if you if you think about cities almost 80% of the actual lots of a city have to do with residences. So the fabric of the city is, is sort of um, predominantly about housing. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I think the, the responsibility of the, the, the sort of um, continuation of the, the character of the city does have a lot to do with with multifamily housing and, and housing in general. Right. You know, um, on your website, you have an interesting section and it says, you know, there's like, you know, who's at the office, the work you've done. And then there's a, uh, I forget what it's titled, but, but essentially like your approach, I think that might be the word actually. And there's like five points on there. And, um, one of the things that's, there's a number of very interesting things said in, in that text. Uh, but one of them that stood out for me was that, uh, let's see here. You had a, a, a statement about authorship, and if I recall correctly, uh, the paragraph was was saying was was kind of understanding architecture as being a system of a sort, and that when that system is in place and understood, um, that authorship becomes sort of removed. Authorship from the architect's hand. Am right. I? Is that is that roughly <laughs> a, a correct uh, translation or summary? Yeah, and and I, I do believe that you know I think um, for me the the work becomes the most kind of exciting when it starts to form itself. You know when you have like these propositions that result in certain kinds of things rather than you know like in design. I mean so like. Our work, I would say, comes out of the construction of like these propositions and the establishment of uh, sort of rules and systems that then generate the actual object itself. It's not about looking and thinking, oh, if I put this, if I make this red, it'll, you know, like l look cool or something. You know, it's more about like an, an ethic than an aesthetic. An ethic instead of an aesthetic is it um is it hard with that approach uh is is the coldness of architecture something that's maybe uh more something you have to be aware of with with that approach 
but you know you're dealing with like real reality realism like reality hmm. um, things have dimension um span like mass you know i mean i think you know real like realism is is um a, a sort of key characteristic i think of good work that it actually it, it sort of explains itself that that's why like i'm i'm sort of critical of these wallpaper buildings that have no explanation of the reality you know they just like wrapping paper and mm. and whether it's you know like glass curtain walls or or these collages you know they have no um sort of um continuity with the the other realities of the building like what its modularity is where it's um supported where it's not you know all those things so i i mean i think you know honestly like most of, mostly our work um is resultant and begins from interiority it's like about the realization of the inside that produces the outside it's not about like starting with a picture mm -hmm. and that sort of you know the picturesque and 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 that whole tradition which you know postmodernism was very kind of focused on i mean i i i i reject that as a a, a kind of approach to architecture because it feels inauthentic because it only deals with one dimension right and the architecture is about the enveloping it's about like the whole you know we had uh robert sonneman the uh, the light maker on the show and a question we asked him which i'd now like to ask you because it's sort of come up is that so he's a modernist right and he likes things quite simple and i was i was asking him uh during the postmodern era uh which is a which is an era that obviously i can only stand kind of looking back on and reading books but right through that time for you i what was it like i mean because my sense is that it was a big movement and a lot of people were behind it were you did you immediately know that you were going to be against this and you thought it was phony or i mean i i feel like i i rejected it but when i look back at my work i also couldn't avoid it you know it was absorbed in some ways into some things that i did but i i I broadly, um, I, I think I, I broadly kind of um, rejected it. You know, my my sort of sense of another kind of moment of the Bay Area's history was that there was actually a pretty rigorous sort of modernist thread especially like at berkeley you know at the school of architecture there were some really amazing architects uh, uh, someone like don olson who built you know this incredible uh, body of work really and then you know what happened is um the sort of sea ranch phenomena which was about the picturesque kind of eclipsed the kind of modernist tradition you know, because the like Sea Ranch came out of like loving barns and you know wanting to make everything l look like a rural sort of shed, right. and and it was all about how things look. Mm. So, um, you know, the, that was that was just a, that's just another sort of part of this postmodern um, sort of thing, and and you know, interestingly enough, like the 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 person who started that sea ranch aesthetic um became in a way the the the, the kind of kingpin of postmodernism or at least one of them so you know this picturesque tradition I, I i think again i just want to um you know be clear doesn't to me fulfill the uh, kind of criteria of being enough to create architecture hmm. you know i think also san francisco 
Uh, so like we we moved from the East Coast to California uh, not that long ago. And um, we go back and forth between L.A. and San Francisco. And a conversation we've had with fellow architects and professionals is what is it? How are the differences between the two cities? Um, and that's a that could go any direction, but more specifically um, with the clients. And there, we've always heard that the Bay Area is is much more challenging and that clients are tend to be much more conservative with what they want from uh, an architect versus Los Angeles still seems to be more like the Wild West, you could call it. Um, is but you know your work is, cer is certainly uh, obviously you're not copying and ca copying and pasting a style. Is it hard to have clients, the general public or community boards, um, get behind some of the stuff that you propose? Are you met with friction? Yeah, I am actually. But <laughs> Let me just stick on that LA San Francisco for one moment. Sure, sure. I, I, I've been fortunate to be able to be working in LA, and and I do find the uh, kind of environment and the acceptance of modern architecture much more um, kind of easy in in LA. Like people don't, um, you know, people people don't kind of expect things to look like something else in LA you know they they just uh, we haven't had much problems with our with our work in LA and and um, you know in in San Francisco one has to argue pretty hard for uh, for for one's position I would say and and you know I I think we 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 get um, a certain amount of resistance to, to our work, but I think we also are able to show that in in essence, it's really about trying to uh, work with the character of the place and and to enhance the sort of quality of the city. And and so you know we we found ways to present our work where people can understand that we're not trying to make funny things you know we're trying to really be expressive of our time and place but also you know really to to sort of work with the the conditions that the city um values as its as its beauty you know it's kind of funny because uh, i i think that one of the interesting things about this profession is uh, and it being design is that a lot of the people who are not architects they don't fully understand what we do or rather more specifically they don't understand what would make one building a good building versus not aesthetically let's say right yeah. um so but when you're having these conversations with folks who are not convinced at the beginning is it what part of that conversation makes them feel at ease and makes them say, okay, I understand what you're doing. Let's go with it. Oh, it's, it's so hard, you know, because people judge things with their eyes. In half in, a second. <laughs> half a second. Yeah. It's almost impossible once that has been made to undo it, you know. But, you know, I, 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 I just... I, I I don't have an answer to to, but I, I I do think things can change. You know, like when I first came to um, Berkeley, you know, like the state of um, the culinary world was pretty much like meat and potatoes. You know, I mean, <laughs> it was sort of like I'd grown up, but you know, look at the change that's happened in in. Uh, the the last like um 25 30 years in terms of the sophistication of people's taste in with food and understanding of like the qualities of like nourishment and health and you know all all of that so like as a model wouldn't it be possible to educate people about the values of architecture as well like, you know, the, honestly, like I, I would say a lot of the architecture that we are um, sort of surrounding ourselves with is like Taco Bell, you know, it's sort of just like real junk food. Yeah. 
and junk architecture. And and honestly, I, I mean, like, you know, you guys go to the East Coast, but like, you know, go to somewhere like Barcelona. I mean, you can walk around and your jaw just drops. Like every corner, there's a like piece of architecture that, you know, is of value and good. I mean, why can't we be doing that? Why do we sort of settle for such low standard? <laughs> that is a million dollar question. I don't know. I, I sometimes wonder if it if it's ingrained and has to do with the kind of individualistic nature of, of um, America as, as a whole. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I kind of get the feeling sometimes that at least in, in terms of people who, who own their own home, it's like, why hire an architect when I can do it myself? Because that's partially the mindset of the, the, this country, I think. You know, I do it myself. Don't And don't tell me what to do with my property. Don't tell me what's, what's good looking or not, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> if you took that same attitude to the dentist, like I'm going to fix my own tooth. No, I mean, <laughs> it's actually, and I think this is sort of something that we could also be helping. To, you know, I, I, I blame, um, I, I was I, I was a teacher for like years and years, you know, so I, I tried really hard to to sort of, like make people understand that there is such a thing as knowledge in architecture. There is like value. It's not all about like my taste versus you. It's not like, you know, um, it's not, it's not about taste or preference. There's mm. actually like a base line of reality and knowledge that it's, um, you know, inherent in, in architecture. I think, I think we need, you know, because like, okay, you can say, okay, I'll, I'll have a McDonald's and it'll fill me up. Yeah. But it'll also at the same time, you know, like fill up your arteries with cholesterol. And, you know, so I, th I think architectures, you know, it, it just, we need to help people to understand what it, what it offers. Mm -hmm. Briefly going back to the discussion of Los Angeles versus uh, San Francisco, was there ever a moment where you thought maybe I'll establish an office or move down south? Well, I think about it every day. <laughs> when it's a gray and rainy day. <laughs> no, you know, honestly, um, we we were quite busy in LA. I mean, some of the things are on hold now, and but you know, there was there was a sort of um, interest in possibly being able to spend more time there, but now it's all kind of. You know, yeah. I, I mean, I, I just got my one of my projects approved at a Zoom um, uh, planning commission hearing in Los Angeles. <laughs> so I, I actually have come to, um, you know, in, in some ways, this um, the the digital landscape that we're living in now um, has has uh, some r remarkable kind of successes and one of them is that i don't have to wake up at like 4 30 you know drive to the airport get on a plane you know fly down it's you know so so <laughs> but i but i do i do love la and 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 if i move to la or if i if i got a little place in la or whatever i could probably be in downtown la because that's sort of one of the parts that i've got to like a lot, even though I love the beach, of course, and you know the the, the like the, the light and air of of West LA. But but I I, I I like downtown too. Talking about your process of design, is there a in your mind is the clear is there is there a, a process that you have that you or a certain approach perhaps that is used on more or less every project? I would say so. That. The, there's, there's a sort of, um, you know, there, there's a, a kind of analytical moment that kind of produces a sense of a direction, and and you know that that kind of guides the the process, and and it's something that you know I feel like there's not much that improves with age, you know, like. I mean, yesterday I had my eyes tested. I have to get new glasses. You know, everything goes down. But the one thing that I feel like is that I'm 
I'm faster and and kind of um, I, I I know the direction that I want things to go in instinctively more rapidly than I used to. It might be that they're not as good even, but that's that's another thing that we'll have to wait for time to judge. But you know, basically, the, 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 the like when I get a project, I'm pretty quick at kind of thinking how it's going to kind of move, which which way it's going to go, and it's based on just you know like practice, I guess. I told you when I was at school, by the you know by the third year, I designed probably you know like hundreds of buildings. So I've I've, I've done lots of buildings over time. So I'm, I'm quite good at making hasty decisions about <laughs> which path to take. And, you know, like typically, honestly, when, when we develop stuff in the office, you know, and I work with um, whoever I'm working with, um, you know, we, we, we essentially don't backtrack much. You know, we, we don't, we, we sort of, refine and evolve but we once we've decided on something that's the way it go, we go hmm. i imagine that's uh well for a lot of reasons one because like you said you've had a ton of practice but uh the size of the team right and i i it's interesting you say that because i you know when i've had to describe the design process to either students or non-architects um something i say is like it's a process of refinement and maybe it's not a perfect, you know, step one, two, three, four, five, et cetera. Like there might be having, might be some going back, but, you know, generally it's a process of refinement and you try and set the core, most important parts of the project from the very beginning. Um, and so for you, is that, does that make sense? Yeah, that, that's yeah. exactly how we work. You know, one of the other things I just want to say about my office, because it is, it is a wee situation. Sure. Um, you know, is that um, by the time a project sort of um, gets built in our office, everybody's worked on it. We, we really are like a collaborative group. You know, we, the people, one person or another will have more of a role, let's say, on a project. You know, they'll be like the project architect. and But, but the way we work, every, everybody eventually works on everything. You know, it's just, it's just how it works. I mean, one guy in our office is better at, like, um, bathroom fixtures. So he'll come, sort of get, you know, it's just, we just all work together on everything. And, and it, 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 is, it is pretty nice. I mean, people have more, like, um, let's say, sense of authorship or, or, or you know, are closer to one project or another. But mm. that, but, but it's, it's always, we all work on everything. Sounds like a fun place to work. Yeah. Uh, I like it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm, not, I'm not in, you know, like a bit lonely these days because I just talk to everyone on the phone but, or, you know, on Zoom. But it, but it, is, not, it, is, it is nice. Wait, so are you guys still um, completely remote at this point? Um, you know, like um, the the three main guys of my office, um, Neil K, Michael Luke, and Ulysses Lynn, come in. M Michael and I have been in the office for most of this whole period. The office has a wall down the middle. I'm, I'm actually at, at home right now, but mm -hmm. the office has a, a wall of books down the middle, low books. And Michael's got one side and I've got the other. He's got one bathroom, I've got the other. So we, we, we've pretty much had our own territory in the office all through this. Mm. Um, but then um, Neil comes in like maybe three days a week and then Ulysses comes in. And so, you know, with the, but, but um, honestly, like, the other, some of the other people in the office I haven't seen since March. Wow. Yeah. You know, and then yeah. we also have stuff under construction and we do go to the job sites. So uh, then I see some of the other people. Half their face. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Ma well masked. But yeah, yeah. but it, I, I have to say, like, um, you know, the, the sort of trial run with this um, 
uh, like digital technology. I mean, it's, it's, it's really proved that it, it, it is a viable kind of um, entity. You know, it's, a, it's another world that actually can work. Right. So, you know, I, I mean, I, I am amazed that we've been able to, I, I can't imagine how, what, what it would have been like to um, have a situation like this without the technology that we have. I think a lot more people would be sick. <laughs> I think I think a lot of architects would be too dedicated and they would come to the office and I'm sure people would get sick. <laughs> yeah, it's possible. Yeah. Um, I was curious if looking back on all the work you've done, if it if it's clear to you when this approach and and specifically the 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 understanding of of kind of architecture as a system and you know it's not about just choosing the right color that you think is beautiful like when did that become more solidified for you right at the beginning you know i had this wonderful teacher um pancha Geddes. uh he was a mozambique architect that um i mean he he was a member of team 10 he was amazing guy and my 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 you know like my greatest teacher and um he would always tease me about like how i always start with a grid and the reason why I start with a grid is because it's a system of order, you know, that you can break mm -hmm. and you can transform. But, you know, so I always, I think I've always approached things with the idea of, um, you know, this like uh, set of conditions that, that would create the detail and, and 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 the the actual sort of object is there a favorite project when you look back it's like asking a parent <laughs> <laughs> oh come on everyone has a favorite kid <laughs> <laughs> you, know, yeah. um, you know we we're redoing our website right now and um so for the home page i'm kind of doing an array of uh the, the kind of office history and and i've been pairing projects to make this so you know there's the transvaal house and 6131 ocean view there's the byron meyer house and the bridge house I, I, so i mean there there these um let's say there are these couples that hmm. that um that live together in, in you know and, and it's funny because there isn't a chronology or i mean ideas get kind of put on a, a back burner and then reappear you know again in another project years and years later i mean i'm just doing a hmm. a small building um with with um bathrooms that are like the bathrooms that i did in the transvaal house you know so i i mean things things um incubate and, and 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 come back and or, or you know get revitalized so i i don't really i mean i have these projects that i i consider to be sort of transformative moments and i, I you know i would say like um you know there's the transvaal house there's 1022 natoma which was my first building in san francisco there's the holocaust memorial Mm -hmm. um, you know, they're, they're these projects that were moments when maybe I, you know, with, with the Holocaust Memorial, for example, I mean, with my office, it was about like really a, a, a kind of opportunity to to create a, a contemporary Victorian. Um, with, with the Holocaust Memorial, it was an understanding about how a simple object can be so dense in kind of potential interpretation and meaning how how you you know you didn't need uh, that that abstraction actually could create so much um like space for interpretation so you know there these there are these projects i mean that that, that have been kind of focal moments hmm. but i wouldn't say i like them better than um others you know just sure. i just realized that they were um 
you know, that something happened there that, that was uh, sort of long, um, had longevity. Is there a particular project type that is uh, your favorite to do? Um, maybe perhaps because it's the most rewarding. And is there a project type that you haven't done yet that you'd like to? You know, it's more or less coincidental that I've fallen into doing a lot of multifamily housing. I mean, I think the the reasons are, you know, that I that I was always interested in in a kind of pragmatism that that could be a, a, a kind of road to a, to to something poetic and and I am I am an incredibly pragmatic I, I think I'm a pretty straightforward like pragmatic thinker so you know I'm well suited to constraint and working with tough conditions and and housing is demanding in that sort of way but you know honestly there's so many building types that I would I would love to I, I mean, I haven't had enough opportunity, in my uh, opinion, to do important cultural buildings. And the ones that I've done, I think, are, you know, are, are part of the best work that we've done, like the Tampa Museum and um, the Beth Shalom. And and I have two synagogue projects that I'm I'm working on right now. So, you know, I I, I love religious buildings because I think, you know like architecture and religion are, are, are sort of cohorts. They, they merge together, you know, as, as, as a way to express the kind of, um, you know, the, the unknown. And, and so, so hmm. I'm, I'm, I, I, I like doing religious buildings and I'm slightly real. I'm not religious really, but I was brought up, um, you know, like immersed in religious ways of thinking. Hmm. Is there anything that you would have done differently in the past of, of your career? You know, like stayed in South Africa. <laughs> <laughs> taken, taken the job that I got offered at Harvard. I mean, there were these things that I decided to not do that I've always worked with. It. They were good decisions, but really... Uh, you know, I don't have time for regret. I, I just want to. <laughs> now I want to make sure that the next years are as productive as possible. I mean, I feel like, you know, I'm I'm on the on ramp to being. You know, I, I'm in my seventies, early seventies, but I'm I'm definitely on the on ramp to being a mature being. So I, I don't. <laughs> endless amount of time to to be working and i just want to make sure that i you know that, that what i do in the next years are just as productive and you know useful as possible well i i know that uh you, you said you want to look forward but i guess an offshoot of the question would be if i could go back and tell my younger self maybe do this differently i mean maybe i shouldn't have stayed in san francisco i've, I've hit my head on the wall here so hard you know it's not a receptive environment for architecture it's mm. been you know i mean i i don't know like if i'd been practicing in la if it would have been you know la accepts architecture as we as we said um where san francisco's resistant i i i i i don't really no, but you know, for whatever reasons, I I stayed here, and you know, I built this beautiful house that I live in, that I love. You know, so I'm I'm not unhappy. No, of course, <laughs> I, of course. If you're unhappy, then that's not good for the rest of us who are aspiring <laughs> to get where you're at. Um, are there things outside of architecture, or even within the profession, within architecture, that inspire you or and the work that you create? You know, the, the legacy of great architecture that exists in the world um, is, is so overwhelmingly inspiring. And, and, you know, even the work that's going on now, I mean, where there's, you know, like 
this sort of constant invention. I mean, I'm still so inspired by, um, you know, looking at a building like the, you know, like something that Le Corbusier did or, or Mies or, um, you know, as well as the amazing work that's being produced um, today. I mean, like I was saying, the work, you know, of... Um, architects in Portugal, in Spain, um, in to- in Japan. You know, I think those those for me are the places where there's really wonderful work that's emerging. Is there a favorite architect? Do you have a favorite architect? <laughs> I mean, I would say Le Corbusier. You really, know, is sort of the grand master. Um, you know. I, I I love Le Corbusier's work. I love Kahn's work. I love Nice's work. But, you know, I must say Le Corbusier beyond anyone else. I mean, I was recently in Ahmedabad and, you know, I went to the Indian Institute um, of Management, you know, that Kahn did. And then I went mm-hmm. to, the, to the mill owner's building and it was such a incredible experience of you know a kind of academic and and you know like very beautiful work versus an absolutely breathtaking piece of poetry i the the two projects I, I need to get out and see more architecture once this pandemic ends. But um, the two projects that always stand out in my mind uh, that I've seen in person are the Salk Institute down in San Diego, pretty remarkable, and uh, the uh, Ranchamp Chapel by Corbusier. Um, that particular piece is, is I always say, like, I could sit there on the lawn or walk around for probably 14 hours and be satisfied. <laughs> probably not be satisfied, actually. I want to stay longer. Yeah, I mean, I must say the Salk Institute is is an incredibly um, powerful piece of work, and and you know, to my mind, uh, like outweighs the the qualities of the Indian Institute uh, hmm. now in the bud. And you know, of Le Corbusier's work, honestly, I've I've seen, um, you know, like to me. The grand buildings in in Chandigarh, you know, the Secretariat and and the courts and are are incredible. But I mean, I also love Sector Seventeen, which is the sort of downtown of Chandigarh, which is basically Mason Domino, just um, unraveled for yards, you know, miles of Mason Domino that have then been kind of appropriated through time and use and become this beautiful, dense um, urban architecture. So, you know, I think, honestly, for me, I, I went to Chandigarh to look at the, um, you know, at, 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 at the cultural monumental works and left more astonished by the, the um, Sector 17 sort of uh, framework architecture of Le Corbusier and how that had been uh, made into this wonderful city. Well, we have covered a lot of stuff in 90 minutes. Um, what is next for you? I'm going to go to work. <laughs> <laughs> ah, beautiful. Thanks to our guest, Stanley, for joining the conversation today. It was quite delightful. If you like this episode and you want to support the show, well, the best way you can help uh, is to actually leave us a review on iTunes uh, on the Apple Podcast app. So you just go on there, leave us a review. If you don't know how exactly, we have a little tutorial on our website. So just go on our website and, and look at it. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel and leave comments to a specific episodes if you have feedbacks you want to share. We are on all the social media, pretty much Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Mm-hmm. And we have a hotline. Yep, hotline number is 213-222-6950. Just shoot a text to that number and it shows up to us. And it could be a question that we could answer in the next show, a guest suggestion, or I don't know, whatever else, a joke. If you have a nice, a good knock-knock joke, let us know. Okay. You know, <laughs> like knock-knock. Who's there? Orange. Orange who? Ah, oh, I messed up the joke. <laughs> <laughs> Well, 
wait, wait, wait. Knock, knock. Who's there? Banana. Banana who? Knock, knock. Who's there? Banana. Banana who? Knock, knock. Who's there? Banana. Banana who? Knock, knock. Okay, I'm tired. Knock, knock. No. Ah, knock, knock. Who's there? Banana. <laughs> yeah, keep going. Yeah. Banana who? Uh, knock, knock. <laughs> Where is this going? Knock, knock. Who's there? Orange. Orange who? Orange, you glad I didn't say banana? <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. I think I learned that joke when I was like, Five? Eight years old. Yeah. <laughs> no, I didn't start speaking until I was eight. Okay, well, maybe we don't need to say that to our audience. <laughs> although that I'm might a prodigy explain, when you think about that, it. Well, right. Although that might explain why you have so much, so much trouble talking. Well, huh. Huh? It's rude to, to say that to someone who is disabled. <laughs> <laughs> you're not disabled. That's rude to say you're disabled when you're not disabled. You don't know. No, I know. Okay. <laughs> is that it for the recording? <laughs> <laughs> All right, everybody. Uh, thanks for listening. Uh, we look forward to speaking with you soon. There's great stuff on the horizon, right? 2021. We're coming Here we strong. Here come, baby. Let's do it. Okay. We'll talk soon. Bye. Bye-bye.